According to this second relationship, the believing consciousness partly has its actuality in the real world of culture and constitutes the spirit and the existence of that world which we have already considered. Partly, however, the believing consciousness confronts this its own actuality as something worthless and is the process of overcoming it. This process does not consist in the believing consciousness making brilliant remarks about the perversion of its real world, for it is the simple, naive consciousness which reckons such brilliance as vanity, since it still has the real world for its purpose. On the contrary, contrasted with the tranquil realm of its thought, the real world is a soulless existence which therefore has to be overcome in an external manner. This obedience of service and praise by setting aside sense, knowledge, and action produces the consciousness of unity with the absolute being. Though not as a unity that is actually perceived, on the contrary, this service is only the perpetual process of producing that unity, a process which does not completely attain its goal in the present. The religious community, it is true, does so, for it is universal self-consciousness. But for the individual self-consciousness, the realm of pure thought necessarily remains a beyond of its actual world, or since this beyond, through the externalization of the eternal being, has entered the actual world, the actuality is an uncomprehended sensuous actuality. But one sensuous actuality remains indifferent to the other, and the beyond has only received the further character of remoteness in space and time. The notion, however, the actuality of spirit present to itself remains in the consciousness of the believer, the inner being, which is everything and which acts, but does not itself come forth. Paragraph 534 is an interesting departure from the sequence of short paragraphs that preceded it and that are going to follow it before we finish up this section. It's a little bit longer. There's a bit more going on here. And Hegel is explicitly telling us at the beginning of this that we're looking at the second, what he calls the second relationship. Uh, this is referring back to paragraph 530, where Hegel talked about the three aspects. So now we're actually looking at how faith or the believing consciousness stands in relationship with the actual world in, as Hegel had said, an antithesis to pure consciousness. Um, what is that pure consciousness going to be? So we're going to see now the world of faith and you might say the practice and the outcome of faith being spelled out here in such a way that it's going to lead to its opposite uh, in the paragraphs to come, the opposite being pure insight. So he says the believing consciousness partly has its actuality in the real world of culture. And this, you know, of course, is, is trivially true. Everybody has to exist in the real world, the actual world, the world in which there's, there's possibility of being. And the question is, can it escape that world? Or is this whole business of faith going to wind up coming back into this actual world? Now, from the point of view of the believing consciousness, there's something wrong with the actual world. That's why it, it moved beyond the, you know, jarring, discordant world of culture in which reason, the, the rational self-consciousness, had attempted to make some sort of progress in understanding itself and in attaining recognition. How is this going to pan out here? So Hegel says it has its actuality in the real world of culture and constitutes the spirit and the existence of that world, which we've already considered. Now, that could actually be read two ways. The world of actual culture or the world of faith. Consciousness is straddling both of these. We see that the world of faith looks very attractive. It's filled with these spirits that are engaging in this process of moving from substance to self. They're harmonious with each other. Does this really satisfy self-consciousness, the believing consciousness? So he says, the believing consciousness confronts this, its own actuality, as something worthless and is the process of overcoming it. What does Hegel mean there? 
What is it overcoming or transcending or sublating? Is it its own consciousness itself as an individual? Or is it also the actual world that it finds its existence rooted in and its very praxis as a religious believer rooted in as well? Well, Hegel tells us, and he, he draws an interesting contrast here. He says, this process of overcoming does not consist in the believing consciousness making brilliant remarks about the perversion of its real world. That's already been done. Remember, we had this, this you know, sophisticated consciousness that was making those sorts of remarks about how you know, screwed up the, the actual world was, the world that itself was rooted within and didn't see a solution to. And then Hegel brings up again the naive, simple consciousness, the, you know, the, the person who's, you, know, you might say, um, trying to bring it all back together, but is still rooted within this actual world and has not yet gone beyond to faith. Or if they have, it's not the faith that we're talking about here. This is very interesting, isn't it? Kierkegaard criticized Hegel for saying that, you know, we begin with faith and then then thinking happens after that. We've noticed now that Hegel, when he uses this term Glauben, he says this is a form of thought. It's not just a naive consciousness. There has to have been an alienation that's taken place. I only mention that in passing because um, it's, it's so often, you know, people take Kierkegaard's criticism of Hegel, which is really more a criticism of Hegelians, as determinative when all we have to do is look within the text to find out that there's more to the story than, than that. And perhaps there's some possibility of connecting the two of them together, perhaps not as, you know, entirely uh, on the same page, but departing from each other much later on than at the start. Coming back to this, so he says, this process does not consist in the believing conscious and making brilliant remarks about the perversion of the real world. It is the simple naive consciousness which reckons such brilliance as vanity, since it still has the real world for its purpose. Well, who's making those brilliant remarks then? The, the skeptic, the person who uh, remained within the, the realm of culture and didn't move on to faith. Or this could, in fact, be the skeptic, the brilliant, you know, sophisticated consciousness before it moves into faith. It might be somebody like Blaise Pascal that Hegel has in mind here. Worth considering. Now, he goes on and he says, on the contrary, so now we're talking about the believing consciousness, contrasted with the tranquil realm of its thought, the real world is a soulless existence. It doesn't have value. It doesn't have real life to it. Why not? Because something else has been discovered that is better than it, that seems to be more alive, that seems to have greater meaning to it, more excitement, more interest. I'm reminded here, and this is a bit of a digression, of Chesterton's uh, interesting arguments made in his work Orthodoxy, and I would say seconded in his Father Brown stories and some of his other stories like The Ball and the Cross, where there's essentially an, an, an aesthetic, not ascetic, aesthetic argument being developed in favor of religion in general, and perhaps we might say of Christianity uh, as its perfect paradigm, although not perfectly revealed to us. And it runs like this. The world is so much more interesting when God is part of it, or beyond it, rather, and this is not, you know, a perfect argument that he thinks is going to convince anybody, but it does get its hooks into some people. And I think that if you want to understand what Hegel's saying about the believing consciousness at this point, it might be helpful to think in those terms. It's a more interesting world and a less 
closed in, claustrophobic, crazy world. The one that has room for the absolute of faith. Now, Hegel goes on and he says, the, the real world is a soulless existence. It has to be overcome in an external manner. How is this done? Notice what Hegel picks out here as the praxis of faith, of the believing consciousness. Is it going out there and doing deeds? No. Is it building churches? Is it teaching classes? Is it, we might go on and on and on and on. Hegel says, no, the obedience of service and praise, setting aside sense knowledge and action, the, the, the stuff of the actual world of culture, produces the consciousness of unity. So we have a consciousness of unity with the absolute being. Is there really a unity here, though? How does any amount of praise or service that we iterate over and over again actually cross us into the infinite? Again, we might think of uh, Hegel and Kierkegaard's criticisms of rationalism and see that there's not that vast of a difference between them. An iterative approximative process never reaches its end. It's Zeno's paradox once again. We can't attain the infinite or the absolute in that way. So he says it doesn't produce this consciousness as a unity that's actually perceived. On the contrary, now this is a wonderful way of framing it. This service is only the perpetual process of producing that unity, a process which does not completely attain its goal in the present. So we might think here now, let's make it more concrete. Think about the monks in the desert engaging in prayer. That's, you know, both service and praise in, in some respect. Praying, you know, uh, praising God, um, you know, showing gratitude, praying for others, uh, confessing their, their sins and asking for forgiveness. All of that produces a consciousness of unity, but it's not one that remains entirely after the act is finished. And it's not one that attains its goal while the act is going on. So when does this unity actually occur? Hegel says it's not perceived as such, but it is cognized as such. Notice the language that he's using here. He's not saying, oh, you feel this, this unity or something like that. This is not a faith of, you know, uh, the affections. Faith is a mode of thought for Hegel. How is it actually attaining its object? So he goes on and he says, on the contrary, right? Um, this doesn't attain its goal in the present. Now notice what he says about the religious community. The religious community does so, does attain its goal in the present, does produce that unity. Why? Because the religious community, as opposed to the believing individual, is a universal, right? But we want to think about, well, what kind of universal is this here? Is this a universal that is being thought as such, a kind of ideal universal, a figment of one's imagination, we might say? Because it's really just a bunch of monks out there in the desert, or it's a bunch of, you know, people singing together in a church, or it's a bunch of people offering incense and meditating together, or what, what, what is this religious community? Hegel doesn't go any further with that here, does he? He just kind of throws that out here, that the religious community does attain through service and praise what the believing consciousness is attempting, but failing to achieve, but does that help the believing consciousness? He says, for the individual self-consciousness, the realm of pure thought 
Now notice, necessarily remains a beyond of its actual world. It is still rooted in its actual world. But isn't the religious community also rooted in the actual world? Insofar as every mem- member of it, and indeed its, its existence, its, its presence, doesn't that have to be rooted in the actual world? I would say yes. So he says, uh, the, the, the realm of pure thought remains a beyond of its actual realm, uh, actual world, or it says, or since this beyond through the externalization of eternal being has entered the actual world, the actuality is an uncomprehended, sensuous actuality. And then he goes on and says, but one sensuous actuality remains indifferent to the other, and the beyond has only received the further character of remoteness in space and time. So the more that we make the absolute being something that we can grasp, something that we can visualize, something that we can relate ourselves to, say as a statue or as a shrine or something along those lines, the more we lose sight of what it was that we were attempting to attain. This is something that Hegel thinks is not just about some far off beyond out there, but the beyond that thought itself is projecting from itself, you, you might say. Let me say that one more time since that might go, uh, uh, it might sound a little bit uh, strange. It is a beyond that thought is projecting within thought for itself as thought, but not fully recognizing as such. So he says, uh, the notion, the actuality of spirit present to itself remains in the consciousness of the believer, the inner being, which is everything and which acts, but does not come forth. What is he talking about there? Well, in the next paragraph, we see him talking about pure insight. So now we're going to see a movement back from this absolute being to the consciousness is it the believing consciousness it's at going to recognize something about all of this that's been going on up to this point and make the transition into pure insight in pure insight however the notion is alone the actual and this third aspect of faith that of being an object for pure insight is really the true relation in which faith here appears. Pure insight itself, like faith, is to be considered partly in and for itself and partly in its relation to the actual world, so far as this is still present in a positive form, that is, as a vain consciousness. And lastly, in that relation to faith mentioned above. With paragraph 535, we're now back to these very short paragraphs and Hegel here begins now talking about pure insight in its own right as something that is coming out of faith or rather is developing we might say from the believing consciousness in a certain sense surpassing itself so he says in pure insight the notion is alone the actual so a transformation is taking place here. The, the concept, the notion, is the actual, is what is present for us. And pure insight is going to be taking this critical attitude towards the world of faith, the world of the supersensible beyond. And so he says, this third aspect of faith, that of being an object for pure insight. Now, Third aspect was its relation to the other, to its other, right? So faith is the other for insight. But insight, how is insight the other to faith? It is the other to faith by by making faith into its object. The object of critical analysis, the object of critical study. Looking at it... um, through a different lens. Remember that earlier Hegel had said that, that in a certain sense, the consciousness of faith was lacking self-consciousness and the consciousness of pure insight, really that's all it had was, was self-consciousness. So this is a very important transition point. He says this third aspect of faith, that of being an object for pure insight, is really the true relation in which faith here appears. 
So this doesn't mean that every person who has faith is going to grasp this. As a matter of fact, you might say that for Hegel, faith, if it's followed through to its full extent, is going to reveal itself as insufficient in relation to the pure insight that is reflecting on that faith. Has it always been like that? I mean, we might think of some of the great medieval thinkers um, talking about the, the relation between faith and let's call it reason, right? Or pure insight, you know? We might think of Anselm's, uh, you know, faith-seeking understanding. Anselm is, is a great uh, believer. <laughs> I understand the pun there completely. Great believer in seeing faith as something that is to be understood, not just rested there in faith. And he says at certain points, you know, like if scripture seems to be saying things that don't make any sense, well, there must be something wrong with our reading of scripture. We need to read it so that it actually does in some sense accord with right reason. And he's taking that as a touchstone. Now Anselm gets accused of everything from being a fideist at one extreme to being a rationalist to being incoherent in the middle uh, or to uh, having a great synthesis of them both. And we might use other examples as well. Coming back to Hegel, he says, pure insight itself, like faith, is to be considered partly in and for itself. That was that first aspect, right? Right partly in its relationship to the actual world, so far as this is still present in a positive form. How is the actual world present in a positive form? Well, faith had seen it as something that was a vain consciousness, and so had culture at the end. And lastly, in that relation to faith mentioned above. So Hegel is now laying out for us these three different uh, distinct movements, saying that now pure insight has to have that. And the entire uh, movement has shifted from faith to pure insight. Will pure insight be able to liberate itself entirely from faith? That's an open question. Is there an asymmetry between them? Clearly there's an asymmetry, even though Hegel has introduced this parallelism of these three moments. Because you notice we're going to move into pure insight. And does that mean that we're going to completely leave faith behind? Good question. We have seen what pure insight is in and for itself, as faith is the tranquil, pure consciousness of spirit as essence. So is pure insight the self-consciousness of spirit as essence. It therefore knows essence, not as essence, but as absolute self. It therefore seeks to abolish every kind of independence other than that of self-consciousness, whether it be the independence of what is actual or of what possesses intrinsic being, and to give it the form of notion. Pure insight is not only the certainty of self-conscious reason that it is all truth, it knows that it is. Paragraph 536 has almost a triumphal kind of air to it, driving ahead, telling us exactly what pure insight is in and for itself. We do have to remember, of course, before we go into this and and look at how wonderful what's being achieved is and how powerful pure insight is, that there are three aspects, right? So what it is in and for itself is the first of them, what it is in relation to the actual world, which which right now it it seems to be getting the, the better of the actual world. That's going to be the second. And then its relation to its opposite or, or correlative faith is going to be the third. So let's stick with this, this you know, uh, first one. He says, we've seen what pure insight is in and for itself, as faith is the tranquil, pure consciousness of spirit as essence. So is pure insight self-consciousness of spirit as essence. Self-consciousness, not just consciousness, not just setting it as an object over there, a beyond, something that is different than than the conscious being. Self-consciousness, that is me. I am that spirit that is essence. Hegel goes on a little bit further. He says, it therefore knows essence, not as essence, 
not just as a being, but as absolute self. This is very interesting, isn't it? When we realize our own critical capacities, when we truly realize them, not just in the process of knocking things down or taking easy shots, but the the scope that they have, what it is that pure insight can actually do. If we're self-conscious of that, at this point, we're now realizing that that divine, that absolute, is not something separate from me that I have to worship through praise and service. That is me. I'm in there somehow. And now notice what he talks about. The independence of everything else has to be, as he says, uh, overcome or abolished seeks to abolish every kind of independence other than that of self-consciousness. Whether it be the independence of what is actual, the actual world, or what possesses intrinsic being, what is anzik, and to give it the form of notion. So it doesn't abolish it entirely. It doesn't just do a skeptical, I don't believe the world is there. Rather, it gives it the form of notion, of concept, of begriff. It makes it into its own object of thought. Who do you think Hegel has in mind here? Does this sound at all, say, like the movement going on in Descartes? It should. It might also, if you read the first parts of Leviathan, even though Hobbes is, you know, of course, a mechanist, definitely not talking about spirit other than a material thing. Might also, you might also think about what Hobbes is doing in his attempt to, you know, reformulate a a science at last, not just for civil society, but of everything. Self-consciousness reduces everything in the actual world to the notion that it can make of it. We might also think about Locke. Perhaps there's a false humility in saying that he's a mere, you know, clearing away of the clutter person so that, you know, real epistemology can take place. Maybe Locke is doing this as well. This is worth considering. Now he says, uh, self-consciousness attempts to abolish every kind of independence other than of its own. Pure insight, he says, is not only the certainty of self-conscious reason that it is all truth. Where did we encounter that? At the beginning of the reason section, right? Now we're in the spirit section. So self-conscious, he says, uh, uh, pure insight is not only the certainty of self-conscious reason that it is all truth. It knows that it is. It has knowledge. It is able to cognize everything being there for it. So this is a very important transition point, isn't it? Pure insight abrogates to itself the right to criticize everything, to make everything into an object for it, to come up with a theory of everything. This is a very different comportment than the faith that we've just looked at uh, in the paragraphs previous to this in this section. 